Elderberry Cottage's windows last night, rain wrote upon, and Bob Dog, while we slept, was miles away, beating the bounds, our frontier nose spy reporting back at dawn. We reward him for knowing about quarrels in Lover's Lane, thieves on the prowl, and other such night walkers. Canny protector, I pray you, bark always when strangers come nigh. Yes, we cannot smell trespass nor hear it as you can. Piss a ring of fire around our house, our curtilage, my land, my concessional lot. Lead me safely at last under this township to my last cot. And when Elderbury is in ruin, guard my grave from the academic wolf, the curious professor with his fine wire brush who would dig me up again from my happiness, your kingdom. Tell us, tell us. Oh, earth, how do you do? You old round raft, oh, how do you do it? You lean backwards and it's winter, and someone taught you two to lean forward and it's summer, you big round fearsome ball, loon. So very light you float, and yet so heavy you are, tons, 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 filled with a mysterious sting, a power string that fastens us all to your sides but makes me sometimes fall downstairs when drunk and then stay put. You tubby flashlight battery, in Baffinland you have plus, and in Antarctica you have a surplus of minus. So much electric charge, so much iron in your giant magnet core, how did it all come about? Boy, never mind. I spin and spin a sometimes weary top with no stop, perhaps. I sleep as me and son and my seven or so desert sisters journey where? To where herself? One day the four big rocks within me, giantess sisters, giant brothers, they will reach the kingdom they were exiled from. When you have finished embroidering shirts for their massive dirts, Shirts made out of the fingerprints of time's whirlwinds, and I will that day see them, find again the golden chess pieces in the grass of a still, awful place filled with a dreadful peace. The Fan A girl spent all day pleading a fan. Either we have Verdun and Kursk, or we have herbivorous people, as the she above, who spend all day in their garden watching butterflies, or playing with a kite, or cutting out colored paper for a fan or a kite, or balancing the reds of zinnias with those of amaranths. For example, that plant called Love Lies Bleeding. I saw a field of men playing football with a criminal's head. I saw a field of sunflowers wiped out by 10,000 tags. I saw Aunt Marjorie's paintbrush destroy a knight in armor and even a villainous peasant. I saw our hockey player break a Russian player's ankle. And I saw the fan, giant in the sky, huge, winnowing. I saw an armored car drive up to arrest an artist who was accounted hopelessly a and unpolitical because he painted nothing but flowers and mice, but of course was suddenly seen as the most dangerous rebel in the Republic. And I saw the fan, big, winnowing, make a rhapsody of a windy day, separate wheat from straw just like that, and blow giants and battlefields like dead leaves away. Maps To go where I first saw maps is almost too simple, perhaps find Pork Street or Hessestrasse, and come up Macomb's side road past Cardwell's till you hit Elmhurst School, where time is reckoned by a pequinet clock manufactured in Kitchener, alias Berlin, and space is taught by grey-green windows unrolled from their special map cupboard and hung upon the wall 
with us looking up at continents mercatorized, anything British vermilionized, with funny stripes for Palestine and Egypt, Iraq, Persia, and Danzig, places only half imperialized, or spheres of influence. However, just over the map cupboard was a wall of continuous windows that contained my uncle's fields. When school was over, basically my way home landscape, it was a map too. Its scale was an inch to an inch, a mile to a mile. There was no map to guide me home save this one and a path, teaching itself white with snow, gray sky, blurred tree sticks, ditch, swamp, forest, meadow, yard, home. Inside my school, the whole world in a round globe or flat maps. Outside our school, a part of the world too big to be taught. The Congress Cafe At the Congress Cafe in Austin, Texas, a group of men and women came in, workers in some state office. They ordered drinks, then meals. After just 20 minutes, you could hear the drink they'd drunk suddenly, happily, speak out in them. This sound of community went on until we left. I have no doubt that afterwards, the drink they had taken coupled some of them in matching ecstasies on Murphy beds. How many things seek their voice in us? Unsuspected demons and angels wait for an arrangement we provide of gut, enzyme, funny bone, nervous system, mind. Blood we lost long ago on Frederick's great battlefield when first he conquered Angria, seeking to circulate once more. The apples of the orchard young Elmer Shearer's father planted, which his son pressed into cider barrels, then drank, which then became his wild mouth organ music, played from a pippin treetop, or husband, on wilder bedspring. Printed press of his sons, Stanley and Geordie, early friends of mine, O Congress Cafe. Department Store Jesus May I help you? You want a Jesus? We have a different style for each of our four floors. For example, in the basement, we stock the demonic Jesus with the hardware and the mousetraps and the colchicum bulbs and the rat poison. Demonic Jesus, yes, as portrayed in Martin Scorsese's film Where Christ Giggles. An efficient young carpenter apprentice to his dad helps his father make crosses for the Romans to use. As portrayed in a handmade film bankroll by one of the Beatles, he says, Blessed are the cheesemakers! And his much more attractive rival is a well-endowed male, amiable but not too interested in changing the world, named Brian. Now let's take the escalator to the first floor, where you may prefer Christ as he really was, classified with Kodak films, notions, perfumes, stationery, and menswear. This historical Jesus is made up of verifiable only facts, of which there are practically none. Did you know there is a serious doubt that he even existed? But finding his grave would help. They've just found that of Caiaphas, the chief priest of his time. The archaeologists are busy. Water walker, speed baker and fisher, virgin birth, we've scrubbed him clean of all that mid-rash rubbish. After all, can you cure leprosy, blindness, and death that easily? Meanwhile, a monastery in Turkey has coughed up a rather interesting Gnostic scrap with regard to a hitherto obscure passage, Mark 9, 51, 52. At last, our suspicions about his sexuality may be explained. Let us take the elevator to the second floor, where the Christ of the Creeds and the New Testament is still available, buyers not many lately, among the pattern china, the records for gramophones, the furniture and dining room suites. Now, this model was born to a virgin, raised the dead, often corpses not so recently deceased, bent reality with his magic, died, then, like Snow White, came alive again, dared to be a crucified wretch on cross, somehow destroyed and renewed a large empire, is no doubt our only hope for translating us out of here. But you know, we get a lot of returns, and customers asking for something really true this time, not so exciting and poetic, more real.
A man who walks on rain is too great a stretch for their brain. Others say they are more than happy, but you can tell they're not by the funny look in their eyes. And of course we provide a booklet, one of many, just in case your difficulty is, say, the ascension. Speaking of which, let us climb these stairs up to the roof of this department store. On the roof of this department store, having a cigarette on his break, I saw a young floor walker leaning against the elevator shaft. By the sudden flash, I recognized him, yes, by the moment glimpse of the nail marks on his hands. Entire Horse Poems written about the Donleys to assist the renewal of the town hall at Exeter, Highway No. 4. Around Barissa Kane in Eyre, the roads twist after cow herds with willow gads, after wise woman spells, after chariots and the widest go around found in a mare's skin. But in Bedulph, Canada, in Mount Carmel's brooder stove, St. Peter's Fields, the roads cross at right angles. A careful Euclidean net, roods, rods, spun out by surveyors out of spider stars, mersac. Spicula, Thuban, and Teres. Like serpents, twitch grass roots, dragons, the Irish roads twist, the old crooked roads twist in the cage of the straight new. We were horsemen, dressed well, and from my brother's entire horse, from his entire horse came the colt, fast fleet hoof hand, with which we seized and held on to the path through Exeter down to London. We lifted the hills, creeks, rivers, slaughterhouses, taverns. We lifted their travelers and those who were asleep when we passed, and those who saw us rattle by as they plowed mud or whittled. We lifted them like gravel dust pennant. We swung them up and out till they yelled about wheels falling off. Unfair competition, yeah! And we lie here now, headless, still, dead, wagonless. Horseless, sleighless, hitched, stalled. As the dressmaker hems my muslin handkerchiefs, the night the vigilantes burnt down one of their own barns, as I sit waiting for a cake to bake and my gentle niece with me, I realize I am not doing what you want me to do. You, bored with your Calvinist shoes chewed to pieces by streets of insurance, streets of cake mix, packages, soap, sermonettes, you want me to, you project a more exciting me on me. She should be burning, clip, axe, giantess, course, I should curse. Why should I accept these handcuffs from you? Don Quixote de la Verismo. Once off Canada, I met a different kind of Don Quixote. Instead of collecting romances, he owned several hundreds of realistic novels. Many copies of James T. Farrell and many, many copies of Theodore Dreiser, illustrated, non-illustrated, all bought with zeal never sated. As for Emil Zola, oh la la, zula la, his collected works piled on a sofa. Now this Don Quixote went on a quest to find nothing of particular interest, but just to let the environment over him be absolutely dominant. He tried hard not to have adventures, and talked to people mostly of their dentures, until he saw one day, beside his highway, giants lined up on the hills. He thought they were windmills. And would they grind some flour for him and fill his water pail to the brim? Oh, these giants with their giantesses of windmills were quite the antithesis. When he climbed up to them with pail and bag of wheat, hoping to get something to drink and eat, these giants with terrific ease tore him to pieces. Oh, tale of woe, another victim of very smo. Don't forget, he had a Sancho Panza, who lagged behind him like a second stanza, and kept telling him they weren't windmills. We live in a fairy tale, not in real-life novels. 
the brothers Grimm are right. Dreeser, Farrell, and Zola ain't. Don Quixote's squires scampered off with a wail, but not without the wheat and the pail, deserting this highway for a nearby wood as fast as he could. Descartes At the top of a lonely house lived a philosopher, lived all alone, chewing on a methodological bone, his only companion an ill-fed mouse. Not quite alone, for in the basement kitchen lived his cook and all sorts. For you, said she, I made soup that smacks, I go to confession, get penance, wax. My children work in a cotton factory, one small one lives here with me. The farmer who brought in food to the cook just happened to have read the philosopher's book. He says, Sarah, that I think, therefore, I am. About us he seems to give not a damn. The farmer went home and refused to stoop over the vegetables he grew, unpicked. Also the cook stopped making the soup and slept on her bed so well feather-ticked. Crawling downstairs to see what was up, the philosopher found nothing to sup. The cook's child told him to go pick some berries, as she had. His eyes were too weak to find any. His mind could barely think. He could not talk, but he took a piece of chalk, and on a wall did he scrawl for the cook and the farmer to see. Yes, I eat, therefore I be. Lichen, you liquor of Precambrian rock, I am your liker. You are both plant and sister to yeasts, molds, rusts, mildews, hungry for green. No stems, leaves, nor roots in you are seen. And so you married yourself to a plant, green plant wed to greenless you, and together you chew, chew, rock into earth. Pre-Cambrian into post-Cambrian, helped, no doubt, by the son and her daughter, water. O oh, determined soil maker, we all lie in the hammock of your ceaseless, patient work. One Stone When I was little, my uncle said to me, Come and play algebra with me. We'll hunt the ex-deer through the forest of numbers. All by myself I've pursued God through the stars, made equations for energy, fought the dragon of chance, made laws for randomness, grew famous by it. My sons never saw me. Yes, when I was eighteen, I came to the edge of the forest of numbers, escaped for a few nights that forest's beast who soon pulled me back. Now I come out of my cell. My wife has died in her sleep. I come out of my house. There is no world left. The use they have made of my equations leveled it. Horizon to horizon, the earth has become one stone. Ice cream. The local poet is riding his bike uptown on a fairly hot summer day, bent on Jumbo's ice cream booth, before mailing a poem to Chimera at the post office. At Jumbo's ice cream booth there are 30 flavors available, including licorice, fudge, lemon, orange, apple, grape, banana, chocolate, cherry, maple walnut, my favorite, Vanilla, of course, peppermint, strawberry, raspberry. Weren't there some vegetable ones? Do I remember onion ice cream? And this pair of double-dip skim milk flavors cost only a nickel each. And the ceiling was of pressed tin. So I plunked down a nickel for maple walnut and so out the door bent on making the cone last till I reached the post office door. The post office is French provincial with four clocks. The poet holds his bicycle up with his left hand, walks slowly licking as he proceeds. Two little girls say scornfully, he's acting just like a little kid, but he thinks 
isn't this what life is all about?